what are the tools with which we can uh, talk about the, the observer, the subjective view on reality? What are the tools with which we could talk about, rigorously talk about free will and consciousness? What are the tools of mathematics that allow that? I don't think we have those tools. Because we haven't been taught properly. So actually tools are there. For instance, um, I think, well, here we have to, I have to say, my, my conviction is that everybody knows. In the heart of hearts, everybody knows that there is that. There is something ineffable. There is something mysterious. And in fact, you know, somehow immediately I feel the, um, you know, the impulse to quote somebody on this because as if as if my own opinion doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a long dead I, expert that has even said it. Einstein said that, you know, so like how see, look at me. <laughs> I am supposed to be like this smart, intelligent person. Yeah. I am afraid to say it and own it myself. I have to find confirmation. <laughs> I have to find an authority who agrees with me. And in fact, it's not so difficult to find because Albert Einstein literally said the most important thing in life is the mysterious, okay? He actually said that. There are some quotes which are attributed to him, which he never said, but this he did. I investigated, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, you know, how do you feel about it? Um, I think that everybody knows. But in other words, he also said, Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge, okay? And he explained, for knowledge is always limited. Whereas imagination embraces the entire world, giving birth to evolution. It is, uh, strictly speaking, a, a real factor in scientific research, he says. And he says, I am enough of an artist to follow my intuition and imagination. That's Albert Einstein, again. So, and I feel the same way, to be honest. If I think about my own mathematical research, it's never linear. It's never like, give me more data, give me more data, give me more data, boom. The glass is full, and then I come up with a discovery. No, it's always, it always, it's always felt as a jump, as a leap. And I, I, I have actually been studying various examples in uh, history of mathematics of some fundamental discoveries, like discovery of complex numbers, like square root of negative one. Mm -hmm. I wonder if a large language model could actually ever come up with the idea that square root, could, square root of negative one is something that is essential or, or meaningful. Because if all the information that you get, that all the, all the knowledge that had been accumulated up to that point, po tells you that you cannot have a square root of a negative number. Why? Because if you had such a square root, we know that if, then we would have to, if you square it, you get a negative number. But we know that if you square any real number, positive or negative, you will always get a positive number. So checkmate, you know, it's over. Square root of negative one doesn't exist. Yet we know that these numbers make sense. They're called complex numbers. And in fact, quantum mechanics is based on complex numbers. They are essential and indispensable for quantum mechanics. Could one discover that? So to me, that sounds like a discontinuity in the process of discovery. It's a jump. It's a departure. It is like a child who is experimenting. It's like a child who says, I'm not afraid to be an idiot. Everybody says, the adults are saying, square root of negative number doesn't exist. But guess what? I'm going to accept it. And I'm going to play with it. And I'm going to see what happens. This is literally how they were discovered. There was an Italian mathematician, astro astronomer, astrologer. He, was, he, he made money apparently by compiling astrological sort of readings for uh, for the elite, you know, of, of, of his era. As one does. This is 16th century, as one does. <laughs> a, a gambler. <laughs> nice. All around interesting guy. I'm sure we would have an interesting conversation yeah, with yeah. him. Gerolamo Cardano. He's all, he also invented the what's called Cardan shaft, so which is an essential component of, 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 of a car. Um, Cardano Vival, we say in Russian. So, so he wrote a book which is called uh, Ars Magna, which is like the great art of algebra. And he was writing solutions for the cubic and quartic equations. This is something that is familiar because at school we study solutions of quadratic equations. 
equations of, of degree two. So you have x, a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero. And there is a formula which solves it using radicals, using square roots. And Cardano was trying to find a similar formula for the cubic and quartic equations, for which, which would start with x cubed or x to the power of four, as opposed to x squared. And in the process of solving these equations, he came up with square root of a negative number, specifically square root of minus 17. And he wrote that I have to forego some mental tortures <laughs> <laughs> to deal with it, but I am going to accept it and see what happens. And in fact, at the end of the four, at the end of the calculation, this 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 weird numbers got canceled. It kind of canceled out. In the formula appeared square root of negative seventeen and its negation. So they kind of conveniently gave the right answer, which did not involve those numbers. So he was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah. Mental tortures. So you see, from the point of view of a, of the of the thinking mind, it is something almost unbearable. It's almost, I feel that a large language model, a computer running a large language model trying to do that would just explode. Mm -hmm. And yet a human mathematician was able to find the courage and inspiration to say, you know what? What's this wrong? Why, why are we so adamant that these things don't exist? That's just our past knowledge. It's based on what our past knowledge is and knowledge is limited. What if we make the next step? Today, for us, mathematicians, complex numbers that we call them are not at all mysterious. The idea is simply that you plot real numbers, that is to say all the whole numbers like zero, one, and so on, two, and so on, right? All fractions like one half or three halves or four over three, but then also numbers like square root of two or pi, we plot them as points on the real line. So we draw, this is, a, this is one of the kind of perennial concepts even in, a, in our very uh, poor math curriculum at school. But now imagine that instead of one line, you have a you have a uh, one axis, you have a second axis. Mm -hmm. And so you numbers now have two coordinates, x and y, and you associate to this point with coordinates x and y, and the number x, which is a real number, plus y times square root of negative one. This is a graphical geometrical representation of complex numbers, which is not mysterious at all. Now, it took another two or 300 years for mathematicians to figure that out. But initially, it looked like a completely crazy idea, you know? Uh, so all it is, all a complex number is, is just an expansion. Two real numbers, two real numbers. Yeah, it's just two, The real it's, part and the imaginary part. It's just an expansion of your view of the mathematical That's world. Right. The fact that you can actually multi, uh, you can add them up by adding um, together the real parts and the imaginary parts, that's easy. But there is also a formula for the product, for the multiplication, which uses the fact that square root of minus one squared is minus one. And the amazing thing is that that, that product, that multiplication satisfies the same rules, mm -hmm. the same properties that are usual uh, operation of multiplication for real numbers. For instance, there is an inverse for every non-zero number that you can find, like number five has an inverse one over five. But uh, one plus i also has an inverse, for instance, you know? That was always there in the mathematical universe, but we humans didn't know it. And here comes along this guy who engages in the mental Cardano. torture, who takes a leap off the cliff of comfort, of like mathematical comfort. Established can, knowledge. Established knowledge. Say, right. And now, obviously, for each, each um, sort of fruitful leap like that, there probably were thousands <laughs> of like things which went nowhere. Yeah. I'm not saying that every leap, you know, it's like it's a it's a it's an uh, open shooting game. Yeah. Because, for example, you can try to do the same with three dimensional space. So you have coordinates x, y, and z, and you can say, oh, uh, if it's one dimensional, we have a, a bona fide numerical system called real numbers. Mm -hmm. If it's two dimensional, which is like you know geometrically, it's just like the the stable top extended to infinity in all directions. These are complex numbers and we can define addition and multiplication and they will satisfy the same properties as real numbers that we're used to. What about three-dimensional space? Is it possible to also define some operation of addition and multiplication on it so that these operations would satisfy the properties that we're used to? And the answer is no. You can define addition, but you can't define multiplication for which there would be an inverse, for instance. So there is something special about the, the plane, the two-dimensional case. And by the way, uh, next question would be, what about four-dimensional? In four-dimensional space, you, you, again, you can, 
and you get what's called quaternions, discovered by uh, an Irish mathematician, Hamilton, in the 19th century. And then in, in the eight dimensional, there is something similar called octonions, and that's about it. So how interesting, these structures exist in dimension one, two, four, and eight, which are all powers of two. Two squared is four, two to the third power is eight. That's one of the bigger mysteries in mathematics, why it is so. So that's a hint, that's a hint of what's missing in our high, in our high school curriculum, <laughs> you know? the, kind of, the kind of fascinating. The mysteries. Uh, mysteries, yes. The appreciation of the mysteries. But so in other words, yes, we resolved with this one mystery that we understood that square root of negative one is real, is meaningful. We build a theory to service those, to, to, to describe those numbers. Did we find the theory of everything? No, because we then invited other mysteries because we, we push the, we pull the veil, so to speak, or we push the frontier and then new things come, get illuminated, which we couldn't see before. That's how I see the process of discovering mathematics. It's an endless, limitless pursuit.